Welcome into this Five Clubs conversation. A little bit different. This is a new program you're going to get periodically throughout the year. Kind of like the Five Clubs scramble. Me, Jay Billis, Gil Hans, and a guest. Now, who that guest is, I know, because Gil and Jay have jobs. Uh, they're not in the guest booking business. So it's my responsibility to get the guests. And guess what? They don't want to know who it is which is right in their wheelhouse as well. No preparation for either one of them, which doesn't matter because whoever it's going to be, they can certainly have a conversation with them. So welcome in to the maiden voyage of the Five Club Scramble. All right, with that, Jay, Gill, this is our maiden voyage here. How are you boys? Doing great. Well, of course, Gill's doing great. He just had a hole in one. And <laughs> I think one of the one of the great things for, for any golfer is, is their hole in one story. And we've all got one. And I want to hear Gill's, then I'll share mine, and then Gary can share his. Yeah, it was, uh, it, thank you for bringing that up. It was, it was amazing. It was uh, opening day for for a new golf course we built out in California, Ladera, and we um, played in a group of. There was ultimately seven of us went back out to finish the last five holes after lunch, so it was a little bit of an intermittent round. And we get to the eighth hole, which is a par three, so second to the last hole, we're finishing on nine. And you know, Jimmy Dunn, our pipes up and says, "Okay, two hundred dollars closest to hundred, you know, twenty dollars a man closest to the pan." A uh, $1,000 man, so he makes a hole in one. So Jeffrey Azoff tees off. He's the best golfer in the group, and he doesn't make a hole in one. And then Eddie Q, one of the founders, steps up and says, all right, now 10000 a man. So lo and behold, uh, it, uh, Jimmy's closest, and I'm the last to hit, and ace knocked it in the hole. And we were going crazy. I mean, it was so much fun. We Everybody was going nuts. And then I think slowly, one by one, they started to think, wait a second. Did somebody say ten thousand dollars at first? <laughs> and the reality sunk in. Anyway, I, I told the guys, listen, I don't want your money, et cetera. Or what, you know, just the memory of it, opening day, you know, the whole thing was was incredible. And then Jimmy says, No, no, you have to take the money, otherwise the story is no good. And so, long story short, we we wind up having everybody donate ten thousand to the Caveman Scholarship Foundation. So great day, great story. My first quote unquote real one. I've had several on the cradle. Uh, but my partner Jim Wagner says they don't count. What about you, Jay? I had one in October uh, at Wade Hampton Golf Club up in Cashers, North Carolina. Uh, I was on the sixth hole, uh, about 155 yards. I was going back and forth between a a big wedge or an easy nine. I hit the nine, uh, took two bounces and went in, and I still couldn't believe it when it went in. Uh, so my partners were very happy. I was shocked and i figured i'd get up there and it would be behind the the pin or something just you know kind of fooling us and uh and it was a blast and uh every, you know talked about it for a long time and uh, i think i'll be talking about it for a long time from now but uh but everybody's got one so gary what's yours i'm gonna save mine for after the show uh <laughs> I, 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 I don't hate Gil. I loathe Jay. Um, and Jay doesn't have one. Jay has two. He has another one at, at uh, a little muni called Kapalua, uh, I believe on the plantation course, right? Yeah, the eighth hole. That was my first one. Yeah, of course. All right. Well, the guy who's joining us, I'm sure he's, if, if somebody can, can shake him awake after those two stories, um, I, I don't want to keep him waiting because Guys, this, this person is not really comfortable doing any public speaking. Um, he's also somebody who is, you know, be nice to him. He's waiting to get his first break in the industry he chose. Um, played basketball and golf in high school. Uh, it's a guy named Jim Nance. <laughs> awesome. Good morning, Jim. How's everybody doing? Fantastic. Fantastic. We're going to be better, Jim. We yeah, are we great. are great. How, how about those stories, Jim? How about how about Gill and Jay's hole in one stories? Oh well, 
listen, the, the, the hole in one of the year is all I care about talking about is the one out of Ladera a couple of weeks ago. There it is. I, her hands. That is just that is just was epic. I've seen the video. I, I knew virtually everyone in that group. And uh, I'm very stoked about what you're building out there, Gil. But congratulations for finally, finally uh, knocking one in. Thank you. Yeah, it was, it was the honor of a lifetime. Pretty amazing with that group and the conversation and the memories. And we, it was during the week of the Amex. So it went viral. It was crazy. It was all anybody was talking about at all the cocktail parties. So it was fun. Well, uh, Paul Marchand is is going to lead uh, the, the the golf efforts out there, and he is uh, my best buddy in the world. We went to school together at Houston. He's a huge fan of yours, and uh, of course Eddie Q. He was up with Eddie at the AT and T shortly after your ace. Uh, it, it was just it was just great to see. Anyway, I'm stoked being on with you guys. I just finished my oatmeal. I'm getting ready to embark on uh, a pretty fun stretch. I get to re-enter Jay's world of uh, college hoops and thank you jay for keeping me apprised of everything uh for the better part of the season and um yeah i'm on i'm on the hoops uh trail starting this week with raft and um and then right behind it's this little tradition unlike any other the masters on cbs i can't wait <laughs> jim is your is your liver in shape to hang out with bill raftery for the uh, next month it, I'm, i've been i tried the last night i, I went I went dry for about eight or nine days, and then last night I thought I better start kind of going through uh, <laughs> through, through preseason workouts, uh, OTAs. Yeah, <laughs> he is. I don't know how he does it, as you know. Uh, he, he is uh, one of the all-time great people, and uh, it, it's very fitting that my my last this can be my last NCAA tournament journey. My first, my first was with Raft. Back in 1986. So in between, uh, I had 18 glorious years sitting by the side of Billy Packer. But I got to start and end my career bookends with Raft. Of course, Grant as well is going to be with us. He's a dear friend. But you know what? Yesterday I was looking. Someone sent me, a friend named Matt Norlander, sent me a video of the first game I ever called an NCAA tournament in my, in my career. And you know who started that game, Gary? Jay Billis. What? Jay it was Billis. his his senior year. It was Duke against Old Dominion. And I just, for the first time ever, I got the YouTube video of it. I didn't even know it existed. And um, I'm riveted just watching and listening how bad I was. But um, it's, uh, it was amazing to think that uh, all these things kind of come full circle. Here I am with uh, you guys today and with Jay and yeah, when I when I get done here in a, in uh, in a month, I will have finished 354 NCAA tournament games. Just tournament, not Big Ten tournament, not Big East tournament, not regular season. 354 tournament games, and then uh, I'm 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 calling I'm calling basketball a career. I'll keep on with the golf and the um, football for a, a long while, I hope. But it sure has been fun. Jay in '86, Jim. Had a he had a nice head of lettuce. You notice he's the only one wearing a hat today. I did notice that. I know there's nothing underneath that hat. No, there isn't. It's a sunny it's a sunny day here in Charlotte, so I gotta <laughs> I gotta keep the sun off the dome. But, well, but I remember I remember that Jim. Uh, it, you you probably won't remember this, but underneath the Greenboro, uh, Greensboro Coliseum at some of these tables they had for the media. Uh, you, Mark Allery, and I sat down uh, there, and you had told us that that you, you had get, just gotten this assignment. You were going to be hosting the NCAA tournament, doing games, and all that. And uh, and you you have actually caused me a lot of problems in my life. Uh, you are you have been so kind to my wife Wendy, and every time she speaks to you, she leaves and says, oh my God, he's so charming. And I said, hey, stop it. He's not that charming. He's a good guy, but let's, uh, let's dial this down a notch. So you, you have, uh, you've made my life more difficult. Well, please give Wendy my best. And uh, that's a very nice compliment. But you know what's amazing is that you actually remember that sit down. I was just trying to glean a few, uh, glean a few nuggets before my first game. And I totally remember being there with you and Allery and, um, Gosh, I mean, how fast those years go, as we all know. But it was fun to be able to say that I launched my career uh, calling a Duke game because Duke became so much a part of the story of, of 
what I got to cover with all the Final Fours. That, of course, was Coach K's first Final Four team. Got to host uh, there at Dallas, uh, as Brent and Billy called the games, uh, Billy and, and, and Musburger. Uh, but it, it's uh, it's been it's been just a joy ride, and I'm I'm like I said I am fired up here to be on uh, with with the five clubs here. This is a a very cool podcast. Well, we and needed we needed Kevin. these guys always figure out a way to to align themselves with the right team. We needed the ultimate ringer because uh, this is the maiden voyage for this program. Uh, Gil, Gil and I have partnered a little bit together. Jay and I, unfortunately, a lot, and and we root so hard against each other. Uh, I don't think we've ever won together. Wow. Yeah, the, the the difficulty, Jim, when Gary and I are partners in a golf match, the other team for either one of us may say, "Hey, that putt's good," and then we say, "No, no, no, it's not," uh, because we're, we're, we have bets against each other, and and actually, we're the only partners that root against each other when we play. That's not a good thing. That never works out well. <laughs> when you have you have a team effort, and then you got the indi- individual things going at the same time. No, it doesn't work out. I'm actually playing today, um, which you know I'm all I'm all set, ready to go here, and I'm I'm so fired up. I haven't played here in Tennessee since the fall, so I played out at Pebble Beach the week of the AT and T, and I played a little bit at uh, Bel Air during the uh, LA Open, the Genesis Invitational. But yeah, it's. Uh, it's great to be talking hoops and, and golf at the same time. Have you, Jim? Have you seen Gills? I assume you've seen uh, the 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 soon to be available to to the fine members of the golf club of Tennessee. His new his new golf course there. Uh, I've seen I've seen what uh, I've seen the aerials as the as the club releases some of the uh, the, the early visuals. Uh, it it is stunning. I mean this. The routing along this uh, ridge, it's a it's a pretty cool piece of property. It's going to be the most amazing views. But you know, I keep pretty close tabs on Gil. I don't know how he has time to do the podcast, to be honest, because he's got so many great projects uh, in the works. Country Club of Cleveland. I'm a member there, and the membership is so excited about you renovating that course. Uh, I mentioned Ladera, but yes, I'm fully aware of what he's doing over at Golf Club. Fully yeah, aware. We've got- we're up on that hill. We're waiting for it to stop raining. It's been a little bit difficult. We don't have uh, pure sand like a lot of our sites. We've got a lot of red dirt up there. So we're we're fighting it, but we're excited. I mean, it's a, it's a property unlike anything Jim and I have done where we're just, you know, we've got these great views, as you mentioned, long distance and, and up at country. I mean, that membership couldn't be nicer. Those people are so welcoming. And, and honestly, I've really enjoyed the time we spent in Cleveland. Uh, which I know not a lot of people say, but it really is. It's a lovely city, and those people are great. And it's an old William Flynn golf course we had the chance to restore, and uh, it's coming out of hibernation now. It'll be ready to go sometime right around Memorial Day, I think. Yes, I'm I'm fully aware. I'm hoping to maybe be there that first week. That'd be and, great. Uh, it, is, it is a great membership, and there is a lot of history. When you say William Flynn and you get a chance to to go in there and touch his work, there's some spectacular holes that are – that are on this course. It's an old classic. It hosted not only um, uh, a recent women's amateur, which was won by Lydia Coe, but in 1935, it hosted uh, the U.S. amateur, the men's U.S. amateur, and Lawson Little won. And Bobby Jones was in his gallery. And there's a there's a marker by the 15th tee that that uh, quotes Jones as saying that Lawson Little, what his golf that week at Cleveland was the best he'd ever seen. You know, Lawson Little is one of these forgotten yep. kind of heroes in the game who won back-to-back U.S. Ams and back-to-back British Ams. So, in effect, he won 32 consecutive matches between those two events. Anyway, uh, that's well, the 16th you, you, you hole, 16th hole where the marker is. But the 15th hole is a spectacular par four, as you know, Gil. So, I don't know what you're going to do there, but it's there's a lot of great ones. You know, a lot of times you walk golf courses and you kind of, all right, have I, you're looking for something you've never seen before. And rarely does that happen. But at, at country, it was 15 and 17 or two holes. I'd never seen anything like right. those before. And it just, it, from an architectural standpoint, gets you really excited. And so Flynn did a good job with them. Hopefully we honored him by putting them back. You know, I'm, as I look at you guys in these four boxes, like, Jim, you kind of had a little bit of nomadic you know, young life. You you were born in Charlotte. 
uh, you know, some Jersey time, obviously, Houston, Texas as well. Gil out there on Long Island. Jay, you were Southern California. I was Northern New Jersey. Do you remember, Jay, the, the first golf course that, that visually struck you? Yeah, the, the, I mean, the first golf course I ever played was my dad's country club, Rolling Hills Country Club in, in Southern California. But the, the first time I really uh, paid a great deal of attention to uh, how courses were set up was when I started playing with you, Gary, and uh, especially up in the mountains. And, you know, you play up at, at Wade Hampton or uh, Grandfather Mountain, um, and topography started becoming more interesting to me and how holes were set up. Uh, but I was looking more at all the hazards I was going to hit in rather than the fairways I could find. So, you know, avoiding hazards was the biggest deal for me. But, you know, one of the great things, in the, and I was going to ask Jim about this, you know, sort of when it became interesting to him. But with you and Gil, uh, that one time when we were at Congaree, and you guys started talking about, all right, let's talk about the truly great golf courses. And something was mentioned, I don't remember what it was, that – I thought was I and somebody said, wait a minute, I thought we were using the word great here, not not really good or you know, great. And uh, and I was going, holy cow, this is a standard I just don't understand. And, you know, Jim, you growing up in the game. Well, first of all, how did you get your start in the game? And then when did when did golf become uh, in your blood where it was, you know, it's, it's a passion of yours? There's a, there's a country club kind of in the in the country of Charlotte on the outskirts called Pine Lake Country Club. My parents joined that club when I was four years old. And uh, I can remember that the club, the course wasn't even open, Gil. And they asked this, the founding members to go help clear the course for the routing. And so my first memory of being on the golf course was tagging along with my parents as was a straight line across the fairway, 50 people strong with wheelbarrows behind with people pushing wheelbarrows and people picking up rocks and sticks and throwing them <laughs> in the wheelbarrow and clearing I can still see marching up that first hole there. So uh, my parents were really into the game. Again, we're, we're, we're North Carolinians. So it's, it's kind of rooted in your, in your soul. And, um, and, and that's the first place I ever played was Pine Lake. It, it, uh, it's still just seared in my mind. And, I hope to get back there. I've heard from the membership. I, I mentioned them about a year ago on another podcast, and the club reached out to me, and uh, we're going to have an event out there one of these days. But my first, like, wow, that's a golf course, and that really makes an impression on me, uh, would have been Pebble Beach Golf Links. We moved in that nomadic life you mentioned, Gary, to the Bay Area. My father kept kind of climbing the corporate ladder, and uh, he was a very curious-minded guy. He loved information he loved to find out what made people go and see museums and different things even if he didn't have any expertise in it he wanted to see everything in his world so i was 10 years old and uh, my parents on three different weekends took us down to carmel and pebble beach primarily to expose us to the this quaint little town of carmel by the sea to visit art galleries and things like that but then they drove us over to pebble beach we went inside the gates we got out of the car and walked over and saw the 18th green in 1969. And I mean, I looked down that 18th fairway from the green back to the tee and across Stillwater Cove and could see the, the perch where the seventh tee resides. And I thought this most beautiful place I've ever seen in my life. And then what all these years later, later, I still feel that way. Mm. It still takes my breath away. Gil, how about you? I, I've never asked you this. Like what, what, what was the, the first impression, impression, lasting impression place for you? So my grandfather was the only golfer in our family, and he played at, at a country club uh, called Southward Ho. And it's a Tillinghast golf course on Long Island. And so he was the one who took me there for the first time. And, you know, it had a Sahara bunker complex, and I, I still remember the scale and, and scope of it. And I think... I don't know if it was being in that landscape with him or it was just the golf landscape itself that just caught my eye and, and attracted me. So Southward Ho would be the first golf course of note that I ever saw. But I think the, the light bulb went off when I went out to National Golf Links for the first time. You know, and that's, I think, Jay, we were talking about sort of the level between great 
and very good. Like National is great. And, and you know, there's an re- incredibly high standard with a lot of golf courses. But when I saw the scale of National and what was attempted and what was created, you know, the first truly great American golf course, that's when really when the light bulb went off with sort of the, the different levels of quality in golf. You know, Jim, you did a video a couple of years ago when Marion did the, the extensive work and the restoration that, that Gil uh, oversaw. You did a video, I think it was intended to be for the membership, um, and you, you're proud of your membership there. See, though, that, there's a handful of places that, that get to you. That place gets to me. There's something, the history, the logo. I honestly think I, I, the first time I stood on the 10th tee and I looked out over it and I went, there's no way some young guy, some Princeton student had the genius to route this. I, I, I just thought it was, Marion to me is, is, is next level in every area. What is it about that place? Well, I think there are two things for, that for me that really strike. One is that every shot has an interesting look to the eye. I'm going to try to talk Gil's language here, and he'll know more about what I'm trying to express. But I can't probably cobble together the right words, but every shot is interesting looking, and it's a fun challenge. And I think there are more shots there at Marion where everything looks unique. And, and just, it, it's like it's its own chapter. Every single shot on that golf course, really, I'm, I'm completely uh, enraptured by it. And the other thing is the club cares so much about history. Uh, they have, and I think every club ought to do this that has had any kind of event that they would be proud of. You need to have either a committee for the archives or you have to, Communities don't always work out well. We know that in clubs. But you need to have an archivist. You need to have a historian. And they have a guy that's just taken it on for years at Marion named John Capers. And, you know, it's it's just something he donates his time to the club. He's a member and he cares about it. And I love the fact that it's all tied together. You know, this game is so, so deeply rooted in the past. And moving forward at the same time, you know, but it, you, you have to know, I mean, I think this sport cares more about those kind of things than any other sport, except for maybe baseball. I think baseball and golf are like that, but Marion, I've never seen a club that is uh, so committed to its history. Like, like Marion is and Gil did a fantastic job. Well, that, that brings up an interesting point, Jim, like history, the difference between history and tradition. And I heard somebody at the Open uh, this last year say something really interesting that grabbed me. The gentleman said, tradition is only useful uh, if it's relevant to the present. And and can you speak to the difference between history and tradition in golf? Well, I, that's, that's an interesting comment. I didn't hear that one. And I thought I watched every single <laughs> second of the Open broadcast. I, I, I get up in the middle of the night and I watch it all. But no, I... No, I think that's really true. I think that I think about the word tradition. It always comes back to me to the line about the masters, the one I used here at the top of the pod, and it, it, those traditions do they they do live. You know, they have you know they they they, they have a pulse, and they're going to be around forever. History seems to be more like just factual, factual based. Uh, bedrock for for a club things you can talk about that have happened that frame it and have built it to what it is today but i think that's well said i never really thought about the difference but tradition does march on and when these are positive things to hold on to as traditions uh, it's wonderful and our game i think again is really honors that thought better than any other do you have is there a-, a tradition that speaks to you, the, the one from maybe the Masters, Augusta National, anywhere that stands out to you in your career? You know, I have my own traditions there that I do every year. This will be my 38th Masters coming up, and there's certain things that I do during the course of the week. Uh, Wednesday afternoon, I always walk down to Amen Corner and try to be there 
for some alone time. And thankfully, our credential allows us to to walk across uh, the Hogan Bridge and I can stand back on the 12th green and kind of look around and have a, a little prayerful introspection and take inventory of where my life has gone in the last year since since I was at Augusta. And this year, I want to go back and explore the new tee at 13. But that's my own little tradition that when we finish the green jacket ceremony, it it it's uh, it's the end of a whirlwind where I've just gone from calling 16 games in the month of March and early April, uh, all things in 16 games and then fly right after the one shiny moment video was played and <laughs> land in Augusta in the middle of the night on Tuesday morning. And I, I walk out Sunday afternoon after the green jackets uh, presented and I, I don't take a golf cart. I walk across the, the par three course. Um, our old compound used to be located at the back of it, but I like to just, again, have a, have a, just a, a moment of gratitude and thanks and be able to make sure I touch all the bases that, that are really deep in my heart. Those are my traditions, the traditions at Augusta that I love. And I, I, I know there are critics out there as time marches on that want things to be done differently, but I really love the green jacket ceremony. And maybe I'm saying that because I've been involved in it for so many years. I don't think it has anything to do with having to, having the chance to be fortunate enough to be in the room. I just like the fact that it's different. Every other trophy presentation kind of looks the same. You know, you're standing out with a lot of people around you, and and um, there's a there's a handoff of, of a of a trophy, and I, I just like it's 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 been around forever, and um, I, I I I hope it I hope it lives forever. I hope that's a tradition that never goes away because it you know it, it's just oh you look at the majors and and. I like the way the Open does it with the champion golfer of the year and all those announcements. But I, I just, I really love the Green Jacket ceremony and I've been involved in that part of it. I started in 86 at Augusta, but 88 was the first year I got to be in the room. And uh, that, that, that's that been the, you know, being being there honestly has been the greatest joy of my career, being, being a part of the Masters telecast. Gil, Gil and Jay, did you guys watch 86 live? Did you watch the 86 Masters live? Yes, I did. Yeah. I was, I was, I watched every live hour of which it was a modest, I mean, it was USA Network <laughs> Thursday, Friday. Right. Um, and, and I was in the TV room at the Sigma Chi house at Bandy with three buddies of mine. And one of my buddies was a lifelong Seve fan. And it was driving me crazy as Jack was doing what he was doing. And when Jack birdied 16, this kid reflexively just said, Seve's at the top of the hill. He said, hit it in the water. He, he flipped him. He, 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 and, but, and then, of course, Jim, your, your moment, again, the, the 16 moment for you, here you are, you're being indoctrinated into this thing, and you find yourself, as all this stuff is coming together, I mean, you're in the, you're in the eye of the needle. And, and when Jack backed off, and again, he just recently passed someone you love dearly, Tom Weiskopf, when you made the appeal to him, and he's in Butler Cabin with Musburger, and, and you said to him, what is he thinking right here? And his response, which was totally spontaneous, is one of the great TV moments of all time. Jim? If I knew what Jack was thinking, I would have won this tournament two or three times myself. <laughs> <laughs> and this, this came on the heels. This would have been like three weeks after I met and Jay and Mallory and Coach K and that whole great team uh, in the second round of the NCAA tournament. This was all happening at the same time. It was all happening very quickly. And it was, it was honestly, it was too big for me. And I, I was able to disguise my, my nervous energy quite well. But um, now that I'm 63, I don't know how uh, I summoned up the strength to just get through it um, because I had dreamt about it so heavily when I was a kid. I wanted to be one of those voices at uh, Augusta it had nothing to do with wanting to be on television. I just wanted to be one of the storytellers there. And then all of a sudden you, you drop out of the sky and you're watching Jack Nichols almost knock it in from the tee with a six iron. And now you've, you're supposed to provide the captions to this. I mean, I am not, I'm not qualified to do this. And, uh, you know, silence is a very uh, important weapon in, and particularly in golf television, you can lay out for long stretches, and it's even better when when you let your words uh, 
count and you use a minimalist approach. And uh, after Jack hit that tee shot and walked around, uh, walked along the water's edge, Frank Cherkinian never cut off of him. And uh, I'm thinking the whole time, you know, how, what am I supposed to say? I mean, I don't. And then he, he knocked it in. And again, you're right. This was just before Sebi hit, hit the four iron in the water at 15. And I just said the bear has come out of hibernation. I heard, I think, Gil, you said coming out of hibernation a, a moment yeah. ago. <laughs> and it brought back, it brought back some, uh, yeah, some memories for me. I would just count my blessings that I had the chance to be there that day, April the 13th, 1986, one of the great days of my life. Gil, when you started doing television uh, for Fox and you're doing, I mean, you were, you were a, you were a one tournament a year guy uh, yeah. because I mean, you've got a job. Yep. Did you, did you study anybody? Did you, because you, you, you were, you were damn good at it. Oh, thanks. Uh, no, I mean, it was crazy. It was the, the first year. So uh, first year for Fox and, you know, everything, all the, the rehearsals, everything was, was centered on Joe Buck and, and Greg Norman appropriately. And so I'm just watching. And literally the first time I ever heard Mark Loomis in my ear, we were live on TV. And I don't know how I didn't just pass out. <laughs> but Jim talked about silence, silence and being quiet. I was scared to death. And so as a result, my comments were very succinct. And, and I understood also that I'm talking about a golf hole and, and I'm hearing Loomis go, okay, as soon as Nicholson hits his shot, we're switching to two. So if I'm talking about the 10th hole, it doesn't matter once they switch to two. So I had to get my thoughts out quickly and just put them in there. And so I got praised for being succinct, but it was mostly because I was scared. <laughs> <laughs> I can understand that one, Gil, big time. You were terrific, by the way. You really were. Well, I enjoyed it. It was fun. It was nice to be able to do a deep dive on courses where we hadn't worked in preparation for the U.S. Open. And, you know, this year, uh, well, I mean, unfortunately, the first year when Fox turned over to NBC was Wingfoot. So I would have had a little inside knowledge and I would have had some inside knowledge last year and, and this year as well. But I guess I was destined to be that in that window. But I enjoyed it thoroughly. Jay, you um, we've talked about this, the mechanics of television and and doing basketball um you're very efficient and economical what is that based on because you're not any other time um <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's uh, absolutely true yeah, yeah. <laughs> i i well I, you know i'm i'm with two three people here that that know better than i do but basketball is easier because the bigger the game i think the easier it is to do because the crowd uh gets involved at, at such a high level and my you know rule of thumb has been if you have to raise your voice to make a point in a game it's better not to say anything at all and just let the crowd take it um but you know my my challenge and it's one that i fight every game is most people aren't tuning in for a clinic on basketball they want to watch the game and you don't have to, you know, break down every dribble for people. So if you can uh, provide something that's useful in the moment, great. If not, it's probably better to, to let the play-by-play -play person handle it um, and uh, and keep your mouth shut. But uh, those, what Jim was saying about laying out, which which for those who don't study broadcasting, it just means keep your mouth shut. Um, those are some of the great moments in television are when broadcasters lay out and and the viewer gets to feel the moment for him or herself and we've all experienced it as as viewers and and consumers of the sports we love and those are the the sometimes the greatest moments and one in addition to jim one of the greatest ever i thought was pat summerall at that of of minimalist uh you know staubach pearson touchdown you know and then it's over and the crowd gets to gets to enjoy it and the the viewing public gets to enjoy it jim you know this uh that that jay did some games i always wanted you guys to work together and now you're getting ready to and you've had great partners i was always hoping there'd be a day that you guys would call the championship game together because i think jay his commitment to the sport he deserves that but he did some games with enberg for like at the end of, of Dick's career doing the NCAA tournament. And the best story Jay share with me is, you know, those first and second round days, you know, it's, it's four games in a day. 
And, and Dick said to, Jay, said to Jay, one day, I guess they were driving in a limo <laughs> to the arena, uh, which Jay was not accustomed to being in a limo driving to the arena. And he said, it's inhumane that they're having us do four <laughs> games in one day. <laughs> he did. Dick said, Dick said, four games in a day? It's inhumane. <laughs> and, uh, and I started laughing. I said, well, it's difficult. Uh, uh, it's difficult, Dick, but it's not inhumane. And uh, uh, we, we had a blast together. And, and Jim, Jim knew, knew Dick very well. And for me, you talk about a bucket list item. Uh, growing up in L.A., Dick Enberg was a legend among legends. It was, you know, he was doing the California Angels, the UCLA uh, basketball games, and and also uh, Ram games. And he had this this show called Sports Challenge, which people of our age remember uh, fondly. But um, so he, you know, he was with Vin Scully and and Chick Hearn at that time in Los Angeles, and then. He did some of my games when I was a player and I got to meet him and I escorted him one time to a speaking engagement. And then we got to work together. And maybe the, the and I wanted to ask you this, Jim, um, maybe the greatest moment I had with Dick Enberg was off the floor. He wanted to go to Belmont Abbey, uh, very close to where you grew up because Al McGuire was the coach right. there. And I told him, I'll drive you there. It was a day between games. And I said, let me take you. And I picked him up at his hotel, uh, not far from where I live in Charlotte. And we drove to Belmont Abbey and spent the day there. And we spent almost the whole day there. It was really uh, remarkable. And it was one of those, those you know, heartwarming moments for me to be with, with somebody I not only admired but loved. And, you know, Jim, all the moments you've had at, at, at Augusta National and elsewhere – the one that sticks out to me is 1992 when your great friend Fred Couples won the, the green jacket and you were in the room and how emotional you were about that. Can, can you speak to, to that moment? Yeah, I can barely get the words out. I, I still get a little jittery thinking back about how that all transpired. I, we were roommates starting in the late seventies and here you fast forward, uh, through a college period where I was very uh, vocal and open about my dreams were to one day work for CBS. That's what I really wanted to do. Specifically, I wanted to be able to broadcast golf in the Masters tournament, and Freddie wanted to win the Masters. So, you know, we used to even, you know, a time or two, we practiced the green jacket ceremony, just two kids play acting and pretending. And that's the kind of hijinks we were up to back in those days. <laughs> You know, we were uh, we were good kids. We weren't partying. We weren't doing anything crazy. We were dreaming. And anyway, it all came together on that day, April 12th, uh, 12th of April, 1992. And it felt real and it didn't feel real because we had practiced it. But now, you know, the whole world is watching. So that stands uh, as uh, alone as the as my favorite memory of my career. The week before, Freddie and Blaine McAllister uh, I roomed with, with Blaine for four years. Uh, they were my runners at the Final Four in Minneapolis, which was Duke going back to back, beating the Fab Five in the in the championship game. So, uh, yeah, it's I've been very fortunate. I've had a lot of those Zelig like moments, and I just love what you just said about Inberg. I, I can't let that go by. Uh, that was really what Dick was all about. He loved the. Uh, triumvirate of Inberg and McGuire and Packer, and they all really deeply care for one another. He wrote the one-man play about Al, so I think they, the one thing I found out, because I knew all three of them really well, especially Billy, but Al just, for some reason, they couldn't get enough about Al's way of life, his mannerisms, and the way he conducted himself. It was unpredictable. There was kindness, there was loyalty, but there was uh, something about Al, that uh, I think everybody wanted to be a little bit more like him. I think Dick did, who's a very buttoned up guy, and Al was the least buttoned up guy. And Billy was kind of coming from the same place that Inberg was. And to hear that he wanted to go by the Abbey and see uh, where, where Al began his coaching career is a very sweet story. And that and that that threesome now, it's all gone. Mm. You know, we lost Billy just a few weeks ago. His birthday was Saturday. And um, I was really hoping he could be... Um, around for the when I finish things up in Houston here in a few weeks. I was going to ask him 
And had he been well, I would have asked him if there was any chance. He probably wouldn't have come, but I wanted him to be there because he was such a big part of my career. And I miss him terribly. Lastly, I want to say before you transition here, uh, and, and Jay, you know about this, but I was sitting at a, maybe it was Buffalo, I think, around December the 10th. Uh, and I was watching a Houston Virginia game, and when I watch sports, I really try to get into it. Like I said, I don't want a clinic, but I want information. I want storytelling. And Jay put on a, a broadcasting clinic that day. And Houston happened to win at Virginia. It had nothing to do with my um, appreciation for what I was listening to. But I don't do that very often. But I picked up my phone and I texted him and said, "That was that was as good as it gets." I mean, he had clearly done a lot of work, a lot of prep on getting ready for that game. He, he knew the rosters up and down. He knew things about players. I think that I know the Houston team inside out and close to the program. But he had it at, at next level, and uh, I was blown away. So uh, that's my goal is to get through these next 16 games as prepared as Jay, and then I can call it a career with basketball. Well, you've got, uh, you've got a golf game today, so we need to get you out of here. By the way, I was going to ask you that I've never seen you in a hat ever. I've never seen you. I've never seen you <laughs> unkept. I've never seen you disheveled. I, I, I'm playing today, by the way. I'm going to name drop here. I'm very excited. I'm playing with Matt Ryan. Oh, nice. Yeah. And he's a really good player. And I'm playing with Eric Church, who I've played a lot of golf with since we bought a home in Nashville. He's a Carolina. I'm sorry, oh, Jay. Oh, he's he's a he's a honk. I mean, he he, he was is. dying lousy last night when Florida State cut it to four. I'm sure. Uh, I will get a full detail, and when I, he hears I was on with Jay, Jay's met him before. I'm sure many times, but he, he you know he's he is a diehard Tar Heel fan, but he's good for college basketball. We need more guys like that. You know, the, 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 we're, we're going through a change in our sport of, of college basketball. We, In some ways, you don't even recognize it, what it is today versus what it was as recently as 15 years ago. But we need the diehards. We need the people that are in it no matter where it's going because they love their school and they love that tradition that you talked about, Jay. So I've got, uh, I've got to hopefully make a few putts here today and uh, hold up the Houston pride best I can. All right, let's let's get you out of here with these five questions. Jay and Gil have a couple as, uh, of the five. What is your favorite grab and go place anywhere in the country? What what, what do you mean? You mean a golf food. course? Food? No, 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 food. Grab and go. What is your favorite <laughs> go to? Chick Fil A. Very reliable. Very yeah, no, I'm, I'm all in. And thankfully, uh, when I had my home, my full-time home at Pebble Beach, we didn't have anything in the area. So it was one of the reasons we moved back uh, to the south a little bit, so I'd be a little bit closer. Now, there are a lot of other reasons I moved to Nashville. I love it. People are great. I still have my home at Pebble, and I still get my three months a year out there. But that is my grab-and-go. I want to hear what Gil and Jay say to that. Grab-and-go. Uh, Shake Shack. I love Shake Shack. That's my favorite. Shake Shack. All right, kill. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm an In and Out Burger guy, but I would I would vote for Chick Fil A to run the DMV because it's the most efficient <laughs> grab and go on the planet. It's true, uh, Jim. I I've got a question for you. What was yeah. what was the TV show that you watched as a kid that's non sports related that you loved? Well, there's a whole group of them. Okay, now I'm a little bit older, but I think you're going to know the genre. Okay, Mary Tyler Moore. Oh, Excellent. Yeah. Lo loved, yeah. loved that show. Um, CBS had a great lineup. I, I sound like I'm shilling or I'm doing a promo here. I had, nothing, I had no idea I was going to actually get to live out the dream and work at CBS. But they had this power-packed Saturday night lineup that had Mission Impossible and Mannix on the front and back and then a bunch of comedies like Newhart and Mary Tyler Moore in between, all in the family. Great stuff. Um the, the Partridge family, the Brady Bunch. You know, I had a little fixation on um, all those Brady girls. Okay, uh, now don't get Jay started. Jay is a Brady Bunch <laughs> trivia. Oh, no, he, he can go like, deep on Brady trivia. Really? Yes. Did you read wow. the yeah, as deep Williams as deep book? as you want to go. Did you read the Barry Williams book about uh, growing up Brady? 
I haven't read that, but I didn't need to. I can I can go with anybody. I bet you I could beat Barry Williams in Brady Bunch trivia because he was in it. He didn't consume it like I did. I had no idea. Well, I've got a copy here. I can I can send it to you. So all right. Well, let's test your let's test you here on Brady Bunch. Uh-oh. What were the middle What were the middle names of the parents? Oh, I've got I've got no chance. So you really are you. Wow. Deep. Yeah, it was from one of the very first episodes when they got married. Um, Michael Paul and Carol Ann. Oh my gosh, that is that is crazy. That is there might not, there might not be ten people in the world that can come up with that. I'll yeah, bet there I'm, are. I'm tapping out. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Just, uh, All right. No idea. Jim, give us give us the profession other than your own that you would you would never want to try. That I would never want to try. Yes. Oh, I thought you were going to ask me if I could be it, do anything else in my life. What would it be? Well, but it be okay. Then let's do it that direction. Well, because I have an answer for that. It, it's it's gills. I think that's the coolest professional. Get in planet. line. Get in line, Jim. <laughs> well, you know, it, it runs through me because uh, I love the detail, and I think I'm a detail minded guy but i love the fact that you get to shape things to shape the earth and it has lasting power you know it will i mean gil hans 250 years from now people are going to be saying this was a gil hans golf course you know and he's going to be you know way up there in terms of like the awe that people are going to have to have his name on it i mean there's there's a lot to be said for that. I mean, there's a permanence that that he has, and it's not that that's what I'm seeking. Uh, it, it's just I think it's just would be really something. I'm not qualified in the least. I've designed some backyard holes, um, best I can, best I can, but um, to see a genius at work craft something that and have that artistic side match up with the scientific side, because there is science here, the engineering of water flow and all of the, you know, all of that, it, it, there's, there's the science and then there's the artistry. Usually people are one or the other in life. He's a scientist or he's an artist. And Gil and the great ones are both. So that to me would be the ultimate profession. Mm-hmm. But when we Gil, have Gil, anywhere near you, you're coming out. We're going to get you on the bulldozer. We'll get you on the uh, <laughs> We'll see the skills you have. I'm in. But Gil, do, Gil, do you think you could stomach listening to Jim Nance walk out every morning and say John Deere, a tractor unlike any other? <laughs> you, know, you wouldn't be able to handle that every day. No, that's what the headphones are for. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Jim, let's let's get you out with this one. What's the last movie you saw in a movie theater? It was a children's movie, and I've got two young ones, so. I'm trying to think of which animated one was most recent. Um, you know, Frozen 2 was too many years ago. That was like two years ago. So um, these latest ones that come out, I can't even remember the titles of them. But I haven't gone to a grown-up movie. You know, I almost caught myself just now doing something that I would say is my <laughs> low career low light. I, and, and I'll go the roundabout way, but I'm telling you, I had... Years ago, Clint Eastwood in the booth at, at Pebble Beach, as, as we've had for 30 years. And Davis Love had just won the tournament. He shot 64 to come from way behind. And Davis, great friend, great pal, had told me one time that his growing up, his favorite childhood actor was, was Clint Eastwood. And one of the reasons why is the first time he went to go see a movie with his dad, it was a Clint Eastwood movie. So we're on camera, and I'm thanking Clint as we're, drawing near the end of the broadcast and he's going to leave to go down to the green and give the trophy away. And I said, Hey, by the way, before you leave, I just want you to know that you're going to be presenting that trophy to Davis. And he's a huge Clint Eastwood fan. In fact, the first adult film he ever saw in his life. You started. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't know what I had said. I just about said it again. Uh, with you guys talking about, I haven't been to an adult film in a long time. <laughs> so, yeah, I felt the temperature in the tower drop about 20 degrees, and Clint looked at me. I didn't know what I had said. He said, I never made an adult film in my life. <laughs> oh, that's not what I meant. <laughs> no, that's awesome.
awesome. Listen, thank you for taking the time. We tried last summer, hopefully a round of golf for the four, for the four of us, hopefully maybe in 23. And Jim, you get Billis. I'll take him. Deal. Okay. You, you, you good with that? You, you, I, I'm getting a lot of strokes now. Hey, the question is whether you're good with it. If we're partners, you're going to have to get used to me helicoptering, uh, uh, helicoptering <laughs> a driver here and there. <laughs> hey, listen, Gary said it. He always thought we were going to be partners. Yep. And I kind of thought we would be, too. And, uh, and I would have loved to have had that chance if it was ever materialized. But let's make it on the golf course. Love to. That's a All deal. Right. That's great. Jim, have a great find, month. I find a gill course somewhere. I mean, I'm sure. There's one or two. Home field advantage. <laughs> yeah, we're, tri we're tripping over them. Yeah. <laughs> Jim, have a great month. Thank you A great all. last run doing this double. Great to be on with uh, all of you, my friends. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, Jim. Thanks. Thanks. You Thank guys. you, Jim. You're the best. You guys are. Thank you. Well, we, on behalf of me and Jay and Gil, we appreciate Jim Nance taking the time. He's getting ready to embark on something that, you know, every broadcaster is envious of the work of other people, maybe more so than what he has done uh, for the last quarter century, which is call the NCAA tournament, the national championship game, and then in the middle of the night, after one shining moment, as he just said, is played, he's on his way to Augusta, Georgia, to call the Masters. Amazing, amazing career, and, and the stories, including the Clint Eastwood story, never heard it before. We appreciate Jim joining us. Most importantly, we appreciate you guys joining us right here on the Five Clubs Scramble conversation. And a reminder, you can now go to our website, fiveclubsgolf.com, for every single interview and conversation any of us have ever had. It's all archived right there and a whole lot more. Thanks so much.